Cross Church family, I'm Kelly Lawson, and I'm here to share with you what to expect from our first Thursday service. But first, this would be a great time to find a seat or share this service online so your friends and family can join us as well. If you're new to our services, we'll have a time of worship where our band leads us in a few songs. In this time, we'll also offer communion. If you're joining us online, you may want to find some juice and crackers in your home now so that you're ready. If you don't have the perfect elements, no worries. It's more about remembering Jesus and what He did for us than it is about the actual elements. After our time of worship, we'll have time in the Word. If you need anything throughout our service, our REACH team is available online to help and here in person as well. We'll be posting links throughout the service to help you get connected. Well, silence any distractions, lean in, and receive everything God has for you. We'll be starting shortly. worshiping with you this evening. We're just going to invite you to worship with us this evening. There is no shadow that has ever overcome your life. And there is no rival that could ever stand against your might. You've always been with us Every battle you've already won Oh, you've already won Yeah. 
God of the impossible. Well, welcome to First Thursday. We are so excited that you guys are tuning in and worshiping with us tonight. And tonight we're going to partake of communion. This is one of those times, those First Thursday services are the opportunity where we come together and we partake of communion together. And so I encourage you right where you are in your home to grab some crackers or some bread, grab, grab some juice, grab some something. It's not about the specific elements. It's really about the practice that we partake of as we, we do this. I mean, I'm so glad that we serve such an awesome God. You know, as we think of communion on that night where he was betrayed, we recognize that he was thinking about us. I mean, what kind of love is this, that he would lay down his life for you and for me? And, and when we partake of communion, there's a few things that we're doing. One, we're remembering his sacrifice, that Jesus laid it all down for you and for me. The second thing that we're doing is, is that we were remembering that it's because of his brokenness that we might be made whole. And I don't know what areas in your life you need healing in, but he was broken so that we can find healing. He was broken so that we might be made whole. And we're, we are remembering that it is by his blood that was shed that we can find forgiveness for our sins. Tonight, as we partake of communion together, we're proclaiming not just his death and his burial, but we're proclaiming his resurrection. We're remembering the sacrifice and, and we're making this declaration, this proclamation that, that we belong to him, that, 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 that as we are followers of Jesus, as we take this step in communion, that, that, that his blood flows through us, that, that we are one with him. So at this point, I trust that you've had enough time to get together the elements. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19, it says that he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we lift the bread to you tonight, just as Jesus did that night. And we thank you for for your son. Jesus, we thank you for your body that was given and that was broken for us that we might be made whole. Lord, I thank you that we come to you tonight. Many of us come to you broken. Many of us, many of us come to you needing healing. And Lord, we thank you. It's because of your brokenness that we can find healing, that we can be made whole. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. Let's break the bread and let's eat. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is my new covenant in the blood, which is poured out for you. Let's lift the cup and let's thank the Father. Lord, we thank you. God, we thank you for sending your son, who is our sacrifice. Jesus, we thank you for your blood that covers every one of our sins. It covers every aspect of our lives. Lord, I pray that you would cover our hearts and our lives today. Together, let's drink. God, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings. God, for your mercies that are new every morning. Lord, we thank you, God, for what you're doing in our hearts and our lives. Lord, I thank you that we serve a God, not just a God of the impossible, but a God of miracles. And Lord, we pray in every house and every family and every, every person that's watching, Lord God, that you'd move in their lives in a miraculous way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, I don't know where you are tonight, but I encourage you, if you need prayer, let us know. Put something in there on the comments, and we'll have people that would love to connect with you and to pray with you. This weekend, we're going to have an amazing service in the house where, where if you want somebody to hold your hand and to agree with you, we'd love to do that in person. And as we sing this one last song, I just encourage you, worship the Lord right there in your home, right there, wherever you are. Lift your hearts to Him. Let Him know how much you love Him and how much He means to you.
We serve an amazing God. We serve a God who does miracles in our hearts and our lives. Let me pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you. God, I thank you for every person, Lord, that is connected to our church, every person that is tuning in tonight or tuning in even on a rebroadcast. Lord God, I just pray, Lord God, that you'd move in their hearts, in their lives, in their families. God, we thank you for what you're doing. Lord, that you are a God of miracles, a God of the impossible. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, 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 amen. Man, we're excited that you guys are joining us here tonight. We're gonna have an amazing night. In fact, we're here on this virtual first Thursday to kind of give our team a break because we've had so many services over Easter and so many people serving and and giving of their time and, and helping us to get here. But tonight, I figured one of the best ways that, that, that the word could come forth is from a friend of mine that I don't get to get We don't get to have him in a lot just simply because he lives in Ireland. And so I just want to take a moment for those of you who don't know Pastor Jamie Corcoran, I'll introduce you to Pastor Jamie Corcoran. He pastors an amazing church in Dublin. They have a few campuses um, in Ireland. And uh, and so if you were in the house, I'd have us put our hands together to give a warm welcome. But right now, just open up your hearts, lean in, because I know it is going to be an amazing message once you tune into the message tonight. Well, hello everyone, or as we say in Ireland, dear dweeve, uh, which is not just hello, but actually also God be with you. Greetings from Lighthouse Church. My name is Pastor Jamie Corcoran, and on behalf of myself, Ludmila, and all of our church family, we want to send our love and greetings to all of our Cross Church Homa family uh, as you're watching uh, today. It's such an honor to be able to be with you. It's always an honor to be with you, obviously physically, three-dimensionally, in person, but it's also an honor to be with you digitally today. And I want to take a moment just to bless and honor your pastors, Pastor Brandon and Rochelle, such great friends of ours. Of course, they've been here a bunch of times. We've been there. Uh, we love them. We love their family. And we love all the leaders and all the people we've met over, over the years uh, that are part of the church. And I've, met, I've learned many, many things from your pastors. I've, I've learned many, many things from Pastor Brandon. But one particular thing I've learned in the last couple of weeks is this. Don't try to ride a BMX when you're over 35 because bad things happen. And of course, we're praying for Pastor Brandon's uh, recovery uh, and hopefully he'll be back fighting fit uh, as soon as possible. Uh, for those of you who've met me before, you would remember my family. Uh, they've been uh, to uh, your church uh, before, my beautiful wife, Ludmila, who's originally from Brazil. Uh, we're about to celebrate 19 years together to be married. Our oldest son is Joshua. Then we have Davi, Isaiah, and our contribution to the cause of Christ globally during covid Uh, our little son, Jonathan, who will turn three uh, in May. And of course, they send their love and regards. They love you guys and they love their church, your church also. Uh, As I was praying, thinking about what message I should bring uh, to you today, I really felt the Lord drop my heart a message that I want to call the word works. The word works. Of course, we know the word of God. We know the value of the word of God. If you're here today and you're not a Jesus follower or you've never read the word, let me encourage you. Let, let the application of today's message be that you get your own copy of the word and you start reading the word. If you're someone that was raised in church or raised in faith and you used to have daily rhythms of being in the word, reading the word, but you've kind of slipped out of that uh, rhythm, out of that habit, let me encourage you. Why not consider uh, as, we, as we kind of cross over uh, the threshold from today into tomorrow that today's a new day and with that comes new opportunities. Whether you're someone who's skeptical, pushing back against faith and doesn't fully embrace or believe in the Bible, I want to challenge you uh, today and invite you to think about maybe rethinking your position because the word works. Now, for me, I wasn't someone maybe like you that was raised in the Christian church. I wasn't raised uh, with uh, the kind of faith that I have now. I actually was raised in a a nominal home. It was a Catholic home. And even though our parents uh, would, you know, once in a while go to church for special events and for special family occasions, there was no real relevance or no real authenticity in our faith. And I remember being a young teenager and I was was a lot of trouble. I mean, if, if you want to be encouraged... Uh, in life, let me, let me tell you, we, I should take time to tell you my story because I was a mess. I was so broken, so angry, so destructive, so antisocial, just didn't fit in the school system, was always in trouble with the police. Uh, for all the wrong reasons, people knew my name. And when 
I first encountered someone who was a real Jesus follower, not just someone who, you know, nominally was called Christian, but actually had a relationship with Jesus. It blew my mind to think that someone could actually know him. Like not, not, not like know of him or know the name or know some religious prayer, but actually know him personally. And as I got talking to that person, that person started sharing, you know, scriptures and verses with me, I was like totally anti-God, anti-church, anti uh the word. But what was interesting was it was actually the problems of Christianity, my problems with Christianity, things that I thought were like insurmountable, the things that I thought were like, oh, once I give them this issue, there'll be no comeback. As I mustered my best intellectual, theological, cultural uh, 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 problems, what I found is the harder I pushed against uh, the Christian message and the person of Jesus, the more actually I drew near to him. And again, it was it was my learning that, that Christianity and, and the word and the things we hold dear aren't, are more than just religious symbols. I mean, I grew up in these churches where all these statues and all this symbolism and, and whatever. But actually, what the Christian message is, is quintessentially about is a resurrected Savior. At the heart of the word, the heart of our message isn't a theology or a philosophy or a sociology. It's a person. And he is the savior of the world. And when I, as a young teenager, was involved in these conversations and pushing back very uh, aggressively, I might add, against the Christian message. Uh, I remember one time I was getting ready to go on a rugby tour uh, to Heidelberg, Germany. Rugby's kind of like uh, football. You guys play football in America, except rugby's for men. You know what I'm saying? We don't need helmets and pads and all those things. We just... You know, we, we think it's good to have teeth. You're going to be married. It's good to have your teeth. So we wear a gum shield. But after that, it's like you got muscles and bones, man. That's your protection. And so I grew up playing rugby. And, uh, and when I was getting ready to go on this, this rugby tour, my friend gave me a Bible. And I was kind of like, you know, being an Irish Catholic, like, uh, what do I do with this? Like, I mean, is it, is it a good luck charm? Uh, you know, if, if I bring it with me, will it mean the, the plane won't fall out of the sky? If I put it in my bag and put the bag against the wall nearest to the field we're going to play, will like the, the, the lucky charms ooze out, not the cereal of course, but the vibes ooze out onto the field and somehow bring us luck in our game. I didn't, I didn't fully understand what the whole point of the word was. And truth be told, that whole time I was there, I never actually read the word. But one night, I found myself just wondering, questioning. We actually had a, had a clean sweep, which means we won all three games. And things were going great. And we had a big party the last night. And can you imagine 40-something, 16-year-olds uh, in a foreign country after winning three games? It was like we won the Super Bowl. We felt like we were invincible. And that night, everyone's partying and drinking. And there's all this freedom and not enough adult supervision. But I found myself wondering, like, like this... this I mean, this seems like everything anyone could ever want in life. Great friends, winning, being celebrated, freedom. Yet what, what is it about this, this success that is so empty to me that I feel like it's not enough? And so I found myself that night wandering back to my hotel room and I opened the Bible that was given to me. I didn't actually read uh, a single word, but just opening it and praying to God. And again, I mean, sometimes we forget if you're not raised in church, how to even pray. Like for me, there was two options. There was the Our Father and the Hail Mary. And neither seemed to be the appropriate prayer that would express what I was feeling in my heart. So I offered up a proverbial Hail Mary. I prayed a half-hearted prayer to a God I didn't even believe existed, expecting nothing to happen. And all of a sudden, God's presence filled the room. And again, uh, my first reaction wasn't like, oh, praise God, oh, hallelujah. My initial reaction was like, oh, no, this is terrible. Because if God is real and God is right and, and God is all the things that my friend has been telling me, then everything changes about everything and everything changes about me. I didn't know it, but in the front cover of that Bible, the person that gave me the Bible had written down a scripture. The scripture is taken from John's Gospel, chapter 8, and verse 32, and it says this, Then you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What I didn't realize was, because I didn't realize the verse was even there, was not even knowing the reality of the verse, because I'd opened up my heart to the person, to the promise, to the presence of Jesus, this verse was actually happening in my life. True story, uh, I came home from that trip, and I found my friend, and 
I said, hey, I want to become a Jesus follower. And they were quite surprised. What happened to you? It was kind of like the, the Apostle Paul in Acts 9. It was like a Damascus, Damascus Road experience. And I was like, I don't know what's going on. I just know I need Jesus. So I gave my life to Jesus and my life began to change. And what was so bizarre for me was, and maybe you're here and you're not a Jesus follower or skeptical. And you're, you're thinking, yeah, well, Christianity is just about good behavior. And, and you go to you know all these church programs to to take control and what was so bizarre to me was I wasn't trying to change me. I, I wasn't trying to stop myself from cussing or stop myself from the things I was doing. Something in me had profoundly and supernaturally changed and that was like coming out of me and changing me to the point where like six weeks after that moment I was again playing rugby and I got into a brawl and I hit a guy and knocked him out and you know all my friends were cheering for me and I was feeling great and you know typical thing you feel as a young you know, 17 year old testosterone filled man in the heat of battle on the pitch. But afterwards, all of a sudden, this feeling of grief came over me and compassion, as if like I began to feel sorry for the guy. And I was freaking out, going, Where, where are these feelings coming from? Like, he deserved it. Like, this, these were his comeuppance. Like, he, he deserved to be whacked in the mouth. I mean, I, I was the, the hand of God's justice in that moment. So, what is happening in me that I feel so bad? And I began to realize, that God's presence was now living in me and now working through me. The truth had come into my life and the truth was setting me free. It's such an interesting thought. The truth will set you free. As you think about the world we live in right now, I know it's a big year for you guys in the US, election year. It's a big year for us here in Ireland too. It's a big year in the world. Every year, every year seems to be a big year. We're all facing colossal, you know, socioeconomic, spiritual battles. But you think about this idea that truth sets us free. This is, of course, the noble quest of all industry, of all science, of all art, of all technology, and indeed all human endeavor. At, at, the, at the end of every human effort, at the, at the end of every quest, whether it's a real quest, a scientific one for the cure of cancer, or, or a, a Hollywood-driven one in terms of a movie, is this idea that we want to know the truth. We want to know the truth. And what's so interesting to me is that we live in a world right now where, where secularism is trying to basically uh, reshape our world spiritually and sociologically. The idea, of course, there is no God, there is no soul, there is no spirit, and there is no eternity. And yet, the harder our world tries to remove itself and rid itself of all things spiritual, the more there seems to be percolating in the hearts and minds of people. I'm sure you feel it. Come on, in the great state of Louisiana and Homa, this sense of people are hungry. Like even though the world and Hollywood and media and, and politics and the world's trying to tell us, no, 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 you know, there's, we're, we're, we've, we've evolved beyond our need for spiritual questions. We've, we've evolved beyond our need for, for a God. Yet, you know, day to day as we meet regular people, there's a hunger, there's a groundswell, there's a, a resurgence within people's lives to ask these questions. One particular figure that comes to mind for me is a guy called Dr. Jordan uh, B. Peterson. I don't know if you've heard of this guy, but he's kind of gone viral online. Uh, he was a uh, lecturer in the University of Toronto, lectured in psychology, is also a biologist, lectured in Harvard, he's an author, has one of the world's most consumed podcasts, there's long form podcasts too, the three and a half hour long podcasts, uh, all about everything. And the number one audience, believe it or not, is actually young men. Young men are listening to this guy in, in incredible numbers. Why? Because they're hungry for truth. They're hungry for, for deep conversation. What's so interesting about Dr. Peterson is a lot of times, even though I don't think he's a believer himself, yet he referenced scripture. I mean, a while back he came to Dublin and, you know, Ireland is supposed to be a country that is like, it's the poster child for secularism. In fact, sociologists have said that Ireland is the fastest secularizing nation in the world. What took nations like France and Germany, you know, decades to do, Ireland is just done in 10 years. And yet here was I as a pastor in this spiritual a landscape that is quite barren, it's quite desert-like, and yet uh, when Dr. Peterson came to Ireland, he filled our largest arena. I sat there with 10,000 of my compatriots, uh, young men, young women, uh, listening to him talk for three hours about the base of family and morality, quoting the Bible. And I was like, what's going on? Like, our world tries to tell us that we're beyond these things, yet I'm looking at the, all these people who are hungry, who are searching, who even though they have money and they have things and they have 
everything anyone can ever imagine. Like we, we've never had it as well in terms, if you look at human history, we've, we've everything we need, yet it's not enough. There's a hunger in the human heart. And actually, Dr. Peterson said this, and I quote, he said, if we lived in capital T truth, if we spoke the truth, then we could walk with God once again and respect ourselves and others and the world. Then we might treat ourselves like people we cared for. We might strive to set the world straight. We might orientate it toward heaven where we would want people we cared for to dwell instead of hell where our resentment and hatred would eternally sentence everyone. This is the kind of stuff people are, are reading, this kind of stuff people are listening to. It's fascinating. Yet oftentimes when I say, well, the truth that Dr. Peterson is pointing towards is actually the truth of God's word. And people go, well, you know, there's probably value in God's word. I mean, it has lasted this long. It is the most uh, read, most bought, number one book even to today in all history. But, the, but what you get today is this. The word is more than just a historical document. Like, from a historical point of view, when you look at all the data and all the research and all the science on the historicity of the word, the Bible is actually the most trustworthy, most robust, most sound, most excellent, most impressive document in all of antiquity. Nothing comes close, believe it or not, to the Bible from a historical point of view. And that's great, and I love that, and I love celebrating that. And if, we're, if we were having an, a, an apologetics conversation, I could give you all sorts of stats about why it's so interesting. But... The Bible is indeed, yes, a manuscript. It is one book that is actually less a book and more of a library. In this book are 66 individual books, three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Uh, we have over 50 authors spanning 4,000 years, all different types of themes. There's Psalms, there's, there's wisdom literature, there's, there's chronicles of kings, there's the gospels, all these different books, yet there's one central message. The Bible, yes, is the word is a manuscript, but it's also a message. And that message isn't just a way, it isn't a, a, a religious uh, system, it isn't a, uh, a, 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 you know, a, what would you call it, a philosophical way of well-being, it isn't an enlightenment, it isn't a, 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 an organization. That message points to a man. And of course, we've just celebrated Easter. And at Easter, more than any other time of the year, we recognize that the Christian faith is built on and centered on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the whole point as we see in this word is that everything in this word points to the person of Jesus. In fact, in John's Gospel, chapter 1, uh, the Apostle John, when he's describing in his introduction the coming of Christ, he says this in verse 14. He says, The Word, the Word, the Word, capital W, became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, watch this, full of grace and truth. <clears throat> John is saying that by Jesus coming in the flesh, he is the incarnate word of God. And yes, full of grace to forgive the world from, the, from, from our sin, from our brokenness and from our selfishness. But also he is the truth. He is everything everyone is looking for, even if they don't realize it themselves. In essence, John says Jesus is the word. He is the word. And the word is truth, and the truth is the only hope and the only help we have as a humanity to be healed and to be whole. Go back to Dr. Dr. Jordan Peterson. Um, a few months ago, I actually had the privilege of meeting Dr. Peterson. It's a crazy story. I'd love to tell you someday over a coffee. But I had this opportunity to spend several hours with him, just me, two of my friends, Dr. Peterson, his wife, another friend, um, uh, over lunch. And it was, it was really cool. And as you can imagine, um, he's a very impressive person. In fact, I would say he's far more impressive in person than he is in his writing or online, which is probably a compliment. And so we sit down, we hit the lunch, and there's no small talk. The first, he looked, he looked me straight in the eye, and the first question he asked me is, what is your enterprise? And I'm like, Ugh. And I'm like, Ugh. And the second question he asked, like almost immediately is, and is it successful? 
And of course, isn't that one of the things we all hate that we're around someone who we perceive as more important to us, more important than us, or more impressive than us? I always get that feeling when I'm around Pastor Brand, like, man, he's so much more impressive, so much more important to me. Like, what do I say? We all have that those feelings of insecurities of of how should we act? Some of you right now, my introverts, come on, introverts, you're like, just don't say anything. Just stay still and become like a gargoyle, like a, a the best looking gargoyle you can be. You extrovert people, you're thinking, well, I can't keep it in, so I'll laugh and I'll say, that's good, but don't send an ounce because if I start talking, I'll be in trouble. We all know that feeling of being secure. I'm sitting there, about to put my, 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 my steak in my mouth, thinking, how do I respond to this question? And then I realized, you know, as my brain was firing, like, what do I do? I'm a pastor, I'm a leader, I'm, I'm a facilitator, I, I, I'm a director, I do all these different things. But as my b- b- brain began to, like, scramble, it's almost, almost the Holy Spirit, thank God for the Holy Spirit, dropped in my heart, remember the most important thing. I was like, of course, the most important thing isn't me, and it isn't what I do. It's who I do it for, and who lives in me. And so I began to tell him the story of how God came into my world and transformed my life. And then I began to paint a picture, cast a vision for what I do as a pastor. It didn't sound, you know, boring and pathetic and dull and and small and, and backward, I began to cast this vision for how in my country, Ireland, and in my continent, Europe, uh, that the message and the hope of the gospel, at the person of Jesus, at the building of his church, is the greatest, most important, most impactful enterprise in all of history, and that I'm humbled to play a very small part of it, but I'm also convinced to the core of my being that the gospel is the only hope for humanity, and that as Paul says, I'm not going to be ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because the gospel reveals to us the word. The word is truth. The truth is is Jesus. And Jesus is the only hope for all of humanity. Yes, science is important and philosophy is important. And I appreciate his lectures and the books that he has written and the conversations he's having. As much as I appreciate all the other uh, uh, parts of of, of what we do as as human beings in the world. But ultimately, the, the center point of the human story is a man and his name is Jesus. And he is not only the hope of all humanity, but he is the hope of humanity in every community. The only hope my nation has, the only hope my continent has, the only hope, come on, the Homa has, the Louisiana has, or the United States of America has, is this, that Jesus is the Son of God and Savior of the world, that He is the Word that became flesh, He is the truth, and we put our trust in that truth. That truth sets us free. Come on, can we celebrate that? Come on, let's celebrate that. That truth sets us free. And we're not afraid of the gospel, we're not going to be intimidated by our culture, by secularism, by what's happening in the media or the news or whatever, because we know the power of the gospel to transform us. We are living proof in our generation of what God has done. And so after my, my very passionate five minute spiel, he just sat there looking at me going like, wow, okay. I mean, you, you, even though he may not agree with everything I said, he could not hide the fact that he was impacted by the, by the impact that has happened in my life because the word has set me free. And again, it's important that we have explanation it's really important that we have conversations. It's really important that we do our best to try to articulate. I mean, maybe you've got lost friends or family or you have co-workers or neighbours and you're, you're trying to like, you know, figure out a creative and, and tactful and, and wise way to share faith. But you know what? No amount of explanation can ever replace an encounter. The whole purpose of our talking, the whole purpose of our sharing, the whole purpose of our preaching is that people would encounter this truth, encounter this word, encounter Jesus. Why? Because when they encounter Jesus, everything changes about everything. So what I'm trying to say to you, church, what I'm trying to say is this. We can be confident in the word. We can be confident, yes, in the manuscript, but we can be confident in the message. Why? Because we're confident in the man. Because we know the message isn't of itself just another idea in a world of ideas. This book isn't just another book in a library of books. This is the Word made flesh. And in 
that flesh, the flesh that is the man, Jesus Christ, who is Son of God and Savior of the world. We can be confident that when we share the message, when we, when we stake our lives in the Word, when we hold to in times of tribulation and struggle, depression, addiction, heartache and heartbreak, when we build our lives on the Word, as, John, as Jesus said in, John, in Matthew chapter 7, that we should, our house will not fall down when the storms come. Why? Because it is built on a solid foundation. And we know that we can be confident in this Word because that Word is truth and the truth is Jesus. And again, as if it wasn't powerful enough to share my story, uh, it also is true of my dad's story. Here's a picture of my father, my beloved father, uh, who straight away you can see is quite an edgy looking dude. Uh, he's ex-Special Forces and ex-1% gang member. So I grew up in a very colourful background, not because there was you know, lilies and daisies and flowers because this is, the, this is my dad, you know, and you think my dad is tough, you should see my mom. I mean, she's, she's even tougher and she probably has as many tattoos as he does. And so even though my dad, the first half of my life was like strict military, living on base, you know, special force, kind of like a Navy SEAL. And then all of a sudden he, he got discharged and had PTSD and he kind of ends up, ends up joining like a 1% motorcycle gang, kind of like the Hells Angels. And so all of a sudden there's parties and drugs and, and prostitutes and guns and all sorts of stuff. You know, in all that chaos, God kind of plucked me out of hell and set me free. And then, of course, I'm now thinking, well, I want to pray for my parents, I'll pray for my, my siblings, I'll pray for my world. And a year later, after I, after I did, devoted my life to following Jesus, I was praying for my parents, and it was Christmas time. And I was thinking, like, what could I give my parents as a gift? And I wanted to express my gratitude, even though things were difficult in our, in our, in our house and our relationship wasn't always great. I wanted to express my 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 gratitude for my parents for what they'd done for me. So I, I got together some money and bought my mom a nice gift. And then I came to my dad and thinking, what can I buy my dad? Like, what do you buy a dude? Like a bazooka, a tank? I don't know. Uh, you know, a, a dummy. You know, I, I don't. I, what do you buy a guy? And so I'm struggling. And and so I prayed. You know, when you first become a Christian, I was like, any problem I'll just pray. Like, should I have a burger or a hot dog? Holy Spirit, speak to me. Uh, and the Holy Spirit always says burger right and so and so I was in that those innocent days and I felt God say to me give your dad the word and I said get thee behind me said are you kidding me if I give my dad a bible he will beat me to death with it I will be the first Christian martyr in Ireland over a thousand years beaten to death by his dad with a bible it was like there's no way and so truth be told I'd have to paint myself as the hero but truth be told I actually chickened out of giving my dad on a Bible. Come on, say boo, boo. Yes, I, I took it now. I should have done better, I know. But after a few days, God was just, you know, mess with me. And I just couldn't shake this feeling like I need to do this. So eventually, I plucked up the courage and I grabbed him about three or four days after Christmas and said, Dad, here's the back story, you know, but long story short, I wanted to give you something of great value. And as I thought about it, I couldn't think of anything. So I turned to God and I prayed about it and I felt God tell me, give your dad a Bible. So, here's the Bible. And I said, I've got two requests. Number one, uh, don't make it a beer coaster and don't you know burn it or tear it up or throw it away. Um, and I wrote in the front cover the same thing that was written in my first Bible. It's a verse in John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 32. It says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And that was that. And he kind of looked at me and went, uh, oh, thanks, I guess. And that was it. And of course, I'm like, whew, I'm off the hook. Like, in terms of my responsibility, my job is done. If my dad spends the rest of eternity in, in, in hell, my job is done. Like, I've done my bit, I'm free. And that was it. Then a couple weeks go by, and uh, I was in church one Sunday morning in February. And I used to play drums in the, in the worship team. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I'm sitting there, and I'm <clears throat> reading my Bible before service starts. And the door opens, and I look up, and there's my dad. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I think two thoughts. My first thought wasn't like, oh, this is great, or, oh, my prayer's been answered. My first two thoughts were literally this. Number one, like, who's in trouble? And number two, am I in trouble? Because <laughs> there has to be some reason for why he's here that isn't positive. And he comes over, and he sits down right beside me. I mean, can you imagine, like, just put that photo back up there, Eric. Like, can you imagine, like, I'm in this white, you know, charismatic, middle-class church, but 30 people, everyone's wearing khakis and sandals. The pastor wore sandals and socks and would hop around like a pogo stick, charismatic during worship, singing, Shine, Jesus, Shine, and these are the days of Elijah. I'm thinking, I'm about to leave my dad in the front row, go sit behind the kids to, to lead church and shine. He is going to absolutely kill somebody. 
like tattoos, letters, combat boots. Like this is this is the worst possible thing ever. So as he sits down, I literally said to him, I said, what the heck are you doing here? Like what what are you I, I have always was disgusted at Trooper Joe that he was there. And he looks at me and says, I don't know. I'm like, what do you mean you don't know? And he said, I don't know. Something woke me up and told me to come. And I'm like, are you high? Like, what's going on? Like, you know, what? And he's like, yeah. So I'm like, I'm literally sweating now going, this is, this is the, thank you God. This is the worst possible thing ever. So I get up, get up to go to the drum kit, service but to start. And just before service starts, the door opens again. And this is a small church zone. We never had anybody come to church that we'd know. We all knew each other. And then we walk six bikers. And again, I grew up in this culture, so I know that if, if you're in another biker territory, another biker's territory, wearing a patch, a backpack, without permission, that's really bad news. You can get beaten up, your patch can be cut off you, and you can even have your motorcycles taken off. It's, it's quite vicious. And so I see them, I don't recognize the patch, so I know it's trouble. As I turn my head to see my dad, he's already up out of his seat, made a beeline for the back, and I'm like, oh my gosh, Armageddon in church. So I jump off the kit and I get down there just in time to hear them answer the question he must have asked, who are you guys? And here was their answer. We are six American Christian missionaries. And this morning at sunrise, we prayed and asked the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, where should we fellowship today? And God said, find a town called Carlo and find a church that meets in the hotel. And so we came. And it turned out that all six of them were former Vietnam veterans, all served in the US military. And I was like, what is going on? Like, how do you make this stuff? How do you orchestrate this? This is bizarre. Well, the good news is church, it only took a few days for my father to surrender his life to Christ, put his trust in Jesus, open his heart to that truth, that truth set him free. He ended up going on to open a drug rehabilitation center here in Ireland. He's now the European vice president for a Christian motorcycle gang. And watch this, someone wrote a book about him that the chief chaplain of the American military got his hands on, invited my dad to go to your Pentagon to address all the staff and awarded my dad the Pentagon's Medal of Excellence for what? For his testimony. What is the testimony? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The testimony is that we can have confidence in the word because the word works. Because the word is truth, the truth is Jesus, and Jesus never fails. He is the hope, the only hope for all humanity. And we can have confidence that the word works. So can we stand? It's gonna pray. I want to pray with you guys as we close off this message. I want, I want to pray for you. That today you'll be stirred up and encouraged if you're a Jesus follower, that you know you can have confidence in the word because the word works. Or maybe you're here and you've been skeptical or you're brought along because you're married to someone who's a Jesus follower or related or just happened to Google it and come today. I want to also challenge you, why not give God a chance? I mean, it's not like you haven't tried everything else. What's the worst that could happen if you were to open your heart to this truth? Maybe the freedom you're seeking from addictions, the freedom you're seeking from fear, the freedom you're seeking from, from, from shame and guilt and doubt and the, the freedom you're seeking from all, maybe the freedom you're seeking, the answer is in Jesus. Why not today open up your heart and give Jesus your life and trust him that he can and will not just set you free, but he will keep you free. For those the Son sets free shall be free indeed. I want to pray for your church as you guys exist in your community to be a, a witness to the city of Homa and to the region around you, whether it's into the great cities or down to the bayous. I just pray today that God would use your church as a kingdom center that would share the good news, that would be built confidently on the word because the word works. Amen. So let's stand and we pray. Father, I thank you for this great church for all my friends watching right now. I honor Pastor Brandon and Pastor Rochelle. Thank you, Lord, for their friendship. Thank you for the connection that our church, Lighthouse Church, has with Cross Church in Homa. I pray, God, that you bless every single person that can hear my voice right now, that you would encourage those who follow you, that they can be confident in your word, that we shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God to salvation. And we can be confident that when we speak the message, when we live the message, when we build our lives on that word, it isn't just a philosophy, philosophy or a theology it is the person of Jesus and Jesus will never let us down for he will never fail us and so I pray that you would Lord just embolden and stir up the hearts of your Jesus followers to be more courageous in the word and Lord secondly I pray for all those friends who are here who are maybe are brought along and are searching and are questioning and don't have it all figured out I pray that they would also Lord just 
have a sense of hope as I'm speaking, that hope would rise in their hearts, God. And whatever it is they're going through, it's depression or addiction or shame or guilt, I pray in the name of Jesus that as they open their hearts to you right now, as they put their trust in you, as they call out the name Jesus, I pray, God, that you would do for them what you did so powerfully for my Father, that you would do for them what you've done so powerfully for me, that you would do for them what you've done so powerfully for millions and billions of believers for, for thousands of years, that you would come into their lives and you would change and transform them, that you would heal them and help them and give them hope and wholeness. And so, God, we thank you today that as your people in this crazy world, that we can be centered and we can be steadfast on the foundation of your word because your word is truth and the truth will never let us down because the word works. It's in the mighty, secure, faithful and good name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Come on, church. And we all say, amen. God bless you guys. I hope that you guys enjoyed that message by my friend, Pastor Jamie Corcoran. What an amazing message and an uplifting sermon for us today. And I, I believe that you were encouraged. Hey, if you're a guest, we are so excited that you worshiped with us. We'd love to get connected with you. I encourage you to fill out our connection card. We've got a link for you there where you can fill that out. And as we're closing out our service, if you're here and you're wanting to give, we do have opportunities for you to give. In fact, at our church, we love the opportunity to give. It's one of the ways that we worship God and we are faithful in the area of our finances. And as your pastor, I want to thank you for your faithfulness. It's because of your faithfulness that we're able to make such a huge impact in the world around us. And if you're a guest, that's not for you. We're just glad that you're worshiping with us. Glad that you are here worshiping tonight. If you fill out a connection card online, when you come in in person, let us know. Let somebody know at the Welcome Center. We have a gift that'll be waiting for you. I know this week the ladies are getting excited next week about the ladies' tea. And uh, I know all of that stuff is going on. We've got lots of fun things, exciting things that are going on here. But let me bless you guys as we close out our service. From Numbers chapter 6, verse 24. It says, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Heavenly Father, be with your people this week. Let us make an impact in our world this week. It is our vision and our mission to bring people to a vibrant relationship with you. So God, I pray that you'd bless us as we do that. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, we love you guys. We'll see y'all in the house this weekend.